All right. Good morning, and thanks for being here today. As we approach Thanksgiving, it's important to take a moment to pause and reflect on the many things in our lives we're thankful for. For me, I'm grateful for family and friends who continue to support me through thick and thin. I'm thankful for my talented team for their commitment to protecting Vermonters and their incredible work ethic. I'm grateful to public servants across the state, our first responders, National Guard, teachers, road crews, and so many more who we count on in times of need. And we've needed them quite a bit over the last few years from the pandemic to the last year's or this uh, summer's flooding. But I'm most thankful for the people of Vermont who continue to inspire me with their generosity and willingness to step up and meet the moment and help their neighbors. And for those who can, I need you to dig a little bit deeper because we still have more work to do. Heading into Thanksgiving week, many will be thinking about getting together with family, sharing a meal with loved ones, and maybe even doing some shopping. But with summer flooding not yet in the rearview mirror, many families are going into the holiday season still trying to make repairs to their damaged homes. And some will be living with family and friends, while others are still trying to figure out what their future looks like. We also know many businesses are still trying to open in time for the holiday season, which they rely on heavily to survive. This is why it's as important today as it was in July for each of us to find ways to give back and support our communities. It could be as simple as a, a simple act of kindness, which can have more of an impact than you'll ever know. And giving your time and labor is another incredibly important gift for those who continue to be overwhelmed by this summer's flood. But there's another way to give back. As you may recall, soon after the flooding, we relaunched the Vermont Strong license plates to raise money for, th for Vermonters and businesses in desperate need. To date, we've sold about 22,000 plates and received about 120,000 in donations, raising nearly $1 million. And this money has supported many in the aftermath of the disaster. But challenges and needs remain, and many of our neighbors are still struggling from a lack of heat, to buying food because their local grocery store is still closed, or even cooking it because their kitchen isn't usable, to paying bills because flood repairs weren't in the budget, to needing mental health services with all this on their shoulders. So starting today and for the next six weeks, we're going to sharpen our focus on fundraising with a campaign that targets specific needs for individuals and businesses impacted by the floods. The Community Foundation will focus its portion on individual needs in four main areas. Home repairs and heat, food security, helping families with household needs, and mental health services. And we'll continue working with ACCD to get the other half of the proceeds to businesses who are still working to open their doors and bring employees back. As I've said, we've raised uh, close to a million dollars so far. And our goal with this campaign is to double it and raise another million. We know how much Vermonters care about each other. The way you showed up over the summer and into the fall is a testament to the strength of our communities and our resilience. But again, there's more work to do and more money to raise to help those still working to recover. So let's remember, we're not just buying plates or socks. We're giving a helping hand to friends and neighbors. And there are other ways, uh, or others out there, who are pitching in as well. And I want to mention uh, Vermont Gloves, uh, for example. So we have, have both the socks, Vermont Strong socks. But we also have uh, Vermont Strong Gloves. And Vermont Strong Gloves is out of Randolph, uh, Sam Hooper. Uh, has been doing this for quite a number of years, and he's giving half of the proceeds uh, to the Community Foundation. So these are worthwhile causes as well, and we know there are others out there doing similar things, 
Uh, so if you are and you're listening, let us know and we'll help get the word out. And please know how much I appreciate your contribution. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan Smith at the Vermont Community Foundation to talk about how they're supporting individual needs and then to Secretary Cur Curley to speak a little more about those businesses who still need our help. Thanks, Governor. So I think it's a, a great place to start and uh, think about the, this week in the context of Thanksgiving, right? And we've got, uh, it's important to say thank you for all that's been done already in the course of this incredible event uh, that's affected so many of our friends and neighbors across the state. Um, but also to recognize that there's a ton more work to do. There's an incredible need that's still out there, particularly as the weather turns uh, and people are living in, in more challenging uh, environments uh, based on the conditions of their homes and the conditions of their places of work. Um, <clears throat> and to date, uh, Vermonters and Vermont businesses have stepped up for the uh, Flood Response and Relief Fund to the tune of um, just over $12 million, of which 10.2 has been obligated um, uh, or otherwise granted out. Uh, this next push, I think what's most important about this next push around these license plate is not just the resources that are come in, that million dollars is gonna go uh, through the uh, Agency of Commerce and through the Community Foundation straight out to those who are gonna need it. But the presence of those tags on the front bumper of cars also sends a message that I think our neighbors need to hear, which is that we're looking out for each other, right? When you see that coming down the other way on the road, it sends a message to somebody who may be wondering in the context of this world, um, who's got my back, you know, between the community foundation, this administration, the state, neighbors helping neighbors, uh, we have each other's back and that's one of the most inspiring things about Vermont and about Vermont communities. We look out for each other and it's really important to go into this time when we're gonna celebrate with our own families, having wonderful meals with our own families, uh, going into the holidays and thinking about what that will bring for our families, to know that not every family is experiencing that the same way. And one of the things we can do is participate in this campaign. So as the governor highlighted, those resources will go out the door, uh, supporting uh, housing and heating uh, implementation through local organizations, working with people who've been affected, food access and family security for people who've been, who are, rec who are wrestling with uh, those issues, uh, supporting mental health and access to the supports as people wrestle with a, a series of crises that really erode our sense of well-being in the world. Um, <clears throat> we know where the challenges are, uh, and this is one of those moments, one of my favorite phrases in the moment of a crisis is that there are some folks in Ver uh, who really run towards a crisis. We're a state uh, where people run towards a crisis when their neighbors are facing it. And as we think about the next six weeks and the ability to raise another million dollars that are gonna go back out the door to support our neighbors, this is a way we can all run towards our neighbors in need. So thank you to everybody uh, uh, for what you've done and what we're gonna do in the next six weeks. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you know, the Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program, or BGAP, which launched, launched less than a month after the floods, has uh, been distributing grants to businesses to get their doors back open and rental housing stock back online. The $20 million program has supported more than 500 businesses with an average grant amount of $37,000. We've heard from many businesses about the real impact that this has had in getting their doors open, their inventory replenished, and their employees back to work. We have also heard from landlords who use the money to get housing fixed up and support the rehousing of people who were displaced by the floods. With the 20 million in, flood, in funds that have been largely allocated, businesses reported more than 160 million in unmet total physical damages. So the unmet need remains great, and we know every penny can help to get them to the next stage of reopening. As we raise more money through the Vermont Strong License Plate Program this holiday season, we will continue to provide grants through the BGAP program for those businesses that were already in the queue but did not get any money. We will not be reopening the application portal as the queue of applications already submitted remains sizable. The ability to grant more money will be the direct result of the generosity of Vermonters, their local communities, 
in the business community in our state. There are many opportunities for businesses to sell these states uh, plates, <laughs> whether they are at their re retail location or maybe they have a vehicle fleet that could be outfitted with Vermont strong license plates like GMP has done. You can see in the photo behind me. Or perhaps they could make their employee uh, gift this year the gift of a plate and the knowledge that those dollars are going to support businesses reopening their local communities. We encourage all businesses to think creatively about how to support their fellow business owners through this holiday season license plate campaign. Plates can be bought in bulk very easily right on the Department of Motor Vehicles website. Again, the recovery is ongoing and many people are still struggling. We can't lose sight of our neighbors in these coming winter months. The need remains great and this challenge to raise a million dollars will help those during a time when they need it most as the stress of the winter and the holiday season builds. Shopping local will also be important this year as our downtowns and our villages look to rebound from not only the physical damage, but lost revenue and economic harm from this past summer. We hope Vermonters and Vermont businesses will get on board with supporting the Vermont Strong Program and help de deliver needed relief and recovery resources. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary Curley. We'll open up to questions at this time. Uh, many different organizations, both on a smaller community collective to large Vermont companies pitching in over the past few months. Anything that stands out to you, either from specific fundraisers to kind of the Vermont spirit across the state? Yeah, I think it's just so widespread and uh, in all different sizes. And that's what, you know, inspires me to want to do more. And, and I've talked about these random acts of kindness, just doing little things that I've heard about people, people just buying somebody else a meal, somebody going and mowing uh, somebody's, uh, some, an elderly neighbor's uh, lawn or just helping them clean up in some way, just everyone trying to give back in some way. And there's still more work to do. So I would encourage anyone, um, it doesn't take long to find somebody who needs uh, a bit of a lift and uh, just, just give them whatever you can, whether it's time or money, buy a plate, buy a pair of gloves. Um, and, and there are many other instances. We'd love to hear about them too, so that we can tell their story you know, because it's, it just tells a lot about who we are as Vermonters. Governor, of course, in <clears throat> Barry, Montpelier, Ludlow, et cetera, they're still living every day with the effects of the flood. But how, how much of the concern is it that people in Chittenden County or in southern Vermont, you know, aren't, aren't seeing it and it's not on their radar every day? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it was a challenge during Irene. I remember after Irene, it didn't really affect much of the upper part of the state, uh, whether it was the the Northwest or the Northeast Kingdom, it just didn't have the same effect as it did in the southern parts of the central to southern. And uh, we struggled with that uh, because uh, people just didn't even know uh, how bad things were. Uh, but I would encourage people to uh, to get out, take a drive, drive through uh, right on 302, right to the main street of the Barry, and uh, look at some of the homes that are still uh, severely impacted. Um, drive through Montpelier, the main street of Montpelier and uh, see the number of businesses that are still closed and struggling to open back up. Take a drive through Hardwick and uh, take a look at the, the hotel or motel that's still uh, halfway in the river and all the damage that they, uh, they felt. Take a drive through Johnson and uh, see the, the store that's still closed uh, there in the central part of the, of the village. And that was the main uh, the, the, the main area of uh, gathering uh, for a number of things, but, uh, but just to get the basic needs, their groceries. So it's still with us, and you don't have to drive very far to find it. Would you say the, the biggest need right now is volunteerism, sort of, you know, bodies and, and people helping out, or is it money, or do you think it's both? I think uh, at this point it's, it's both, um, but money is going to go further at this point. Um, but there are still volunteer efforts, still things to do. I was, I was out uh, last weekend with, a, with our team, and um, we finished up uh, another playground in Barrie, and that's, uh, that's our third. Um, so 
there's there's still work to do. We have one more playground to go in Barrie, and hopefully we'll get that done before um, before things freeze up. Um, but um, but there are playgrounds throughout Vermont and, and, and areas, parks and so forth that are, still need need some help. On a separate but similar note, do you know what what's the latest with the FEMA trailers uh, in in Montpelier, the mobile housing units? Um, they've signed the agreement. As far as I know, they've signed the agreement with the city of Montpelier. Uh, FEMA has, uh, so they'll start construction soon uh, to put that uh, the utilities in and, and get the pads in and so forth. And I think they're looking uh, into some probably middle of the winter. Um, before they're placing the first trailer, but it'll it'll take some time. Is it surprising that it's taking that long? Would you say? Um, it's uh, it's discouraging that it took so long, but uh, but I'm not surprised. Uh, these are, you know, big decisions to make. Uh, they had to find an area that was suitable to them. Uh, we're dealing with the federal government, and we're dealing with the local government, and we're dealing with the state at the same time. So we're all trying to in the same direction, but I think the, the good news is we're on a, on a path now uh, to, to provide for uh, a certain segment of our population to have a, a home for the next 18 months. Is there any update you can give on the efforts to get heat to those who still might not have it? Yeah, I mean, we, we make ground every day. Um, we had over 200 uh, that we, we contacted. Um, and, uh, and it looks like the number is down to, I think last I read, um, Friday might have been like 20 or 30, and we're still trying to reach. Um, but, um, but we're in different stages there, and hopefully uh, we'll get that accomplished. Uh, and we do have, you know, plan B if not, but, um, but I think we're going to get there. Well, so, say looking at the Vermont Community Fund, can you just explain a bit more into where those dollars have already gone to work in the community and how Vermonters who may have still applied and not received it yet, how they might be able to qualify or get that money in the community. Sure. So we've been running that fund, uh, the flood response and relief fund in phases, you know, from the sort of second day after the flood. So the challenge is you never really know how much you're going to have to work with, so it makes budgeting uh, particularly complicated. You know, we've been, so we've been issuing them in stages and phases over, uh, since you know, the second week of July. Uh, the first phase was really oriented around immediate emergency response, right? Making sure people had a place to go, making sure they had food, making sure volunteers were organized. A lot of local grassroots work, like the Montpelier Alive, Montpelier Strong work in downtown, local berry organizations and similar grassroots organizations. Moving more into systemic work, you know, uh, uh, the community action agencies, Capstone Community Action has been a great partner in getting uh, economic and food resources out, helping organize case management in terms of uh, people applying for federal resources and navigating those kinds of things. Uh, we just closed out a $1.5 million program in, in close coordination with the Agency of Agriculture supporting flood affected far Vermont farmers. Um, it was, you know, I think um, roughly 150 different farms received grants directly from the flood fund uh, to support you know, their cash flow going into the winter months. Uh, so the dollars have been coming in and going out as they've come through. Right now, uh, as we articulated earlier, it'll be focusing on, uh, <clears throat> we've been working on a partnership with Efficiency Vermont and some other folks around getting resources into the hands in, uh, to address the heating crisis. Uh, we'll be continuing to work on that case management question, particularly Vermonters who are left out, uh, potentially, of FEMA resources, so letting those processes run and then figuring out how we can use the philanthropic dollars to backfill the gaps that are left in public resources. We never quite have as much to work with as the public sector does, but we can fill gaps um, fairly nimbly and fairly quickly when they're left in. Um, and that's one of the things that we learned in Irene, one of the things we saw in the pandemic, um, and one of the things we've been able to effectuate in the last four months. I will say the most important thing, and the thing about which we're, as an organization, deeply grateful, none of this works if we're not able to coordinate really closely with the administration. So the partnership uh, between the administration and the Vermont Community Foundation has been really, really deep and really, really clear and transparent. So we've been able to put resources to work effectively and hopefully with, by in, in ways that minimize redundancy and that support the Vermonters who most stand to benefit. We'll continue to do with that with this um, next push of the campaign. Uh, we'll get those resources back out to those who can most, um, most need them and can most put them to work. 
Governor, last week you appointed five Superior Court judges, two of whom have extensive experience um, as uh, defense attorneys. You know, those aren't the typical folks that wind up on the bench necessarily. How do you how do you think about that decision to uh, appoint public defenders? Yeah, the, you know, it's never been for me. It's never been about. Um, appointing a prosecutor or defense attorney. It's all about the person, how they view the law, how they're even uh, uh, keel, um, their, their ability to, to look at both sides of any, any uh, conflict and uh, do what's best and adhere to the law. So uh, again, we've, we've appointed uh, defense attorneys in the past. Um, but but I don't keep track because it doesn't really matter to me um, what what they get. It's, it matters to me uh, that they adhere to the law and that they um, they deal with things with a level level hand. According to a <clears throat> recent report from the state treasurer, I think the state pension funds um, for state employees and for teachers. Still has a deficit, something to the or shortfall, something to the tune of two hundred million. Have Have you seen the latest numbers? I saw that number, um, as you might remember. I uh, I vetoed that bill uh, because I didn't think it did enough. It didn't go far enough. Uh, that I didn't believe that it was going to solve our deficit, um, and it appears it hasn't. Is there anything else you think that should be done in this coming session, or will you be making any recommendations? I, I think they made it pretty clear. Uh, they had no interest in what um, the suggestions I had. Um, if they want to take them up, I, I was uh, resoundly uh, overridden uh, by the legislature. So I think it's up to them to make that move if they want to. Got a few folks on the line we'll go to next. We'll start with Tim McQuiston from Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, Governor, a couple of things via of the legislature. Um, the hospital uh, financing system is, is, I think, pretty clearly unsustainable. Is there, do you have any thoughts about trying to work with legislators on trying to figure out a way forward and um, <coughs> I'm not sure you could fix it, but at least to find a way forward in, in trying to assist them. Well, obviously, uh, we all have the shared interests there. We want to protect our health care system. That's, uh, that's very important to every single Vermonter. Um, but the Green Mountain Care Board has a role to play as well. So um, we will continue to work with the Green Mountain Care Board and legislators uh, to do whatever we can to make sure the, our health care system is healthy. And that's uh, that's important. Um, for um, Secretary Curley, I'm wondering if you've been able to um, have any data on how much economic activity was lost from the the summer storms, and some of it was the perception of people coming here thinking Vermont was closed. Do you have any idea of what what might have been lost? Uh, we have uh, tried to uh, survey to we have done some surveys to try to um, to to determine that to be honest with you I don't have that information with me and I'm not sure how accurate it's going to be because there's there's no way because it's so fluid um, I'm just not sure how accurate it will be that being said Tim I'd be happy to connect you with the team at ACCD so you can see what we have gathered um, to uh, see if there's any uh, strong conclusions we can draw from that, but uh, but I don't have anything with me here that I could that I that would be helpful right now. It's large. Does it seem like the, uh, <laughs> the the revenue reports have offered any insight into that? You know, the rooms and meals tax receipts and sales tax and things. Uh, I think it's too soon to tell. Um, I think that we'll know a little bit more in the coming quarters. Okay, fair the, enough. Thank you. Yeah. But one thing I will say is uh, one thing I will say is that we are starting to see reports um, from the the lodging and hospitality industry that that would indicate that in certain areas the the uh, visitors uh, visits were stronger than they anticipated. Um, and I will say, you know, I, I you know, a little kudos to the team to our our uh, tourism team, tourism and marketing team for getting 
out very quickly to let folks know that Vermont was in fact open for business and that the best way that they could support Vermonters was to come to Vermont. So um, again, you know, hopeful that, that we, you know, I realized there were areas of Vermont that certainly, you know, were not able to welcome folks. There were, you know, uh, places that were not open, but, but for those that were, I'm hoping that they did see a consistent, um, consistent uh, numbers that they had seen in the past and in some places, as I mentioned, they saw some uptick. So um, hopefully we'll have better numbers for you in the coming uh, quarter. All right, thank you, Secretary. On, on that, Tim, you know, it's really anecdotal, but uh, my, my many trips to Johnson, I'd go through Stowe uh, during the um, September months and or September weeks and um, and it was packed. It was just I, I couldn't believe. I, I don't think I've seen as many people in in Stowe at that uh, time of year. Um, so they did quite well. But you get to to Johnson, and again you see the devastation there. Or you return to Montpelier, and you see the devastation there. So I guess it it really depends on where you were. Uh, Ludlow, um, I think, is going to be interesting to see uh, their numbers uh, when we uh, when we're able to attain them and see um, the impact it might have had on them. But um, but again, it really depends on on your geographically uh, geographic area. All right, great. I'll keep an eye on that. Thanks. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. All right, we'll try Keith, the Rotten Herald. <clears throat> Hi, um, my apologies if this was already covered, but I was wondering if we knew exactly how many people are still without heat and what the holdup might be with that, if it's a labor thing or money or they're just not contacting you or, or what the situation is. Yeah, Keith, um, we, we did have the question before. It is somewhere around, if I've got these numbers right, I think it was as of Friday, um, we had uh, maybe 30, 20, 30 um, families uh, that, um, that we're still trying to get in touch with and haven't been able to, uh, so we don't know about them. But the vast majority we've been able to to help, and there are different stages of recovery at this point. Um, so we think uh, we'll be able to to accommodate everyone, um, but um, but we're still trying to reach out to to some, and um, and that's been a bit of a struggle. And and I would say the the reasoning behind uh, maybe the various stages of uh, repair are all the above, whether it's workforce or whether it's supply chain, whether it's uh, funding um, and w whatever else that, that might be the case. Uh, it's, it's all across the board. So we're trying to fill all the gaps we can. Uh, we've had a lot of help from the Efficiency Vermont and the Fuel Dealers Association, uh, and they've been rallying uh, and helping and supporting these families. So, uh, so again, it's a testament to Vermont. Uh, everyone seeing the issue, uh, coming together, and, and trying to fill those gaps as needed. Thank you. Are they concentrated in any one area, or are they scattered, or? Um, scattered a bit, but, uh, but it would be no surprise to see that um, some, many, are in the Washington County area, the hardest hit uh, area in the state, uh, particularly in the Barry area. Yeah, so it was about 30. That's down from what was it before? I can't. I think I can't it was like two, it seemed like it was 250. But we let me let me get you the exact numbers um, so that unless Dan, do you have those? I, I, I want to give you the exact okay. numbers. We'll get you the exact numbers uh, so I don't get this wrong. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor. In your the previous uh, press conference, uh, you and the Commissioner of Housing went through an extensive list of uh, the things that we still need on the regulatory side to help with housing and the uh, increase in productivity in the state. Um, I don't recall the date that you were going to meet with a legislative team about that. I was curious if that has happened and if there are any modifications you made in that presentation prior to that. Yeah, no, we haven't put all that together. This will be a, a package we'll put together uh, for the legislative session. Uh, it'll be pretty broad and pretty bold, um, along with a, a, another public safety package as well, and that will be equally 
as bold and broad. Will you be uh, sharing that with the public at the same time? Um, we will be, we haven't decided at this point, um, but uh, somewhere between now and January something, we'll get something to you. Very good, thank you. Back to the room. Governor, where, where do we stand with um, flood debris and the, the cleanup? A few weeks, months ago, you'd said that there was a concern, especially given yeah. the winter and then the spring meld. How, how, where do we stand with that? We're, we're getting there. I, I mean, there's still debris uh, left, but I think the vast majority has been picked up, and we continue uh, to use state resources in picking up any additional debris that we encounter. Uh, but uh, but come, come spring, I think you, if, you, if you take a look uh, at all the riverbanks right now, uh, the leaves are gone and all we see is sticks and debris at this point. Uh, so I think um, we'll have another push for Green Up Day in May and I, um, I would say that there's going to be a lot to pick up uh, at that point in time, probably more than any other year that I can remember. But, but you're not concerned, like with debris, at this point, it sounds like with debris, with right. you know, clogging up storm drains and things yeah. like that. The, the debris, the, the municipalities, uh, they did reach out to us, some did, and needed assistance, and we provided that assistance. Um, so it looks like at this point, fingers crossed, uh, that we're in pretty good shape in terms of our storm drainage. Are there any big points after this summer's flooding that we're looking at, similar to how in Irene we knew we needed to rebuild a lot of bridges in a different way? Is there any specific infrastructure that kind of jumped out this time? Yeah, I think it, it really is in our watershed areas and uh, looking for opportunities to, to store water for the future and during these flood events. Um, that'll be, uh, that'll be I, I think, a, a focus point, at least for me, um, and, uh, and trying to, to make sure that we're protecting our resources as best we can. Uh, and that could mean different things in different communities. But, um, but first, uh, doing this uh, evaluation of the watershed uh, is going to be important, and we're working on that. Can you explain what you mean by store water? Is that dams? Is that floodplain? Yeah, m mostly just to let it expand naturally, right? So if, if take a... a River bank um, that uh, or river that might be 50 or 100 feet wide. Uh, we need to expand that, you know, to terrace it out of that, and and increase the amount of uh, capacity that's available uh, for land. Just naturally open up and flood in these wetlands and, and different areas to make sure that there's a place for it to go. Because if we can store it, uh, we we know uh, climate change is real. We're going to have the continue to have these uh, intense storms, um, so we're going to have intense rains and, and a lot of water. So we just need to figure out, you know, it's a, just a giant math problem how to store that volume of water so it doesn't impact our downtowns and villages. A few weeks back, you were in Rutland for their public safety town hall. Um, you just mentioned your upcoming public safety package you plan to bring to the legislature. What, what stuck out with you from that meeting? How might that impact your thoughts on legislation going forward? Um, I think the anger and frustration and fear uh, that I heard that night from, from the residents of Rutland, and I, and I would say it's not dissimilar from what I'm hearing in, in the Chittenden County area, Burlington in particular, but other parts of the state as well. So as I've said, I think the, the pendulum might have gone a little bit too far in some of our criminal justice reform, and we'll be looking at at least bringing proposals for the legislature to consider uh, to try and get back to the middle. Just a moment ago, Governor, you mentioned um, a, a proposed assessment of, of our, our floodplains. What, what did you mean by that? And are, are there any specific um, areas that, that you'd be looking at in our watersheds yeah. of restoring? Um, I probably should let, um, I don't know if anybody's on. For, I, I will have uh, Secretary Moore talk to you about this specifically because we do, um, we are working with the federal government and, and others uh, to try and 
do this study uh, to, to determine where we might be able to expand uh, some of the storage capacity and what would be make the most sense, where the choke points uh, in our watershed. Um, so, um, but she, she and her team are working on that, so it would be better if it came from her. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving.